right, here's the real deal. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be made known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there's any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard, saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at your last care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to me, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to, to, be, to abound everywhere and in all things I have learned, but to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Through 19 broken? Yes. Nevertheless, you've done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all in abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. As I look at the group on the screen, and I think for the ones who are not with us, I see a lot of need. Hallelujah. God just said right there, he just promised. And his promises are not those that vary from time to time. His promises are true. They're ever faithful. And he said that he will meet all our need. That means our health needs, our financial needs, our health needs that are changing from day to day, our relationship needs, our spiritual needs, our national needs, whatever the needs are. God is here and he's ready, he's able, he's capable, and he's faithful to meet all of our needs. And uh, tonight in the scripture passage, we're going to go through two chapters and I'm going to teach quickly but hopefully an anointing will come to your heart and say, ah, that's for me. So I want you to ask God right now, Lord, meet my needs, whatever they might be, mental, emotional, physical, spiritual. Meet my needs, Father, in Jesus' name. Karen's going to be my reader from time to time, and she's going to start with Acts 6, verses 1 through 15. I'll stop her like I do and ask questions along the way and make observations. We're so glad that TJ has joined us from wherever he is, and uh, we praise the Lord that you're with us, brother. So Karen, begin reading Acts 6, 1. During those days, the number of Jesus' followers kept multiplying greatly. Stop. Yep. Notice, when God is really, truly working, there's multiplication. Additions. We learned that in the second chapter, the first and second chapters of Acts, that they added to the church when? Once a year? Daily. Once a season? No, once a day, daily. So God has got to get that in our minds today. This is not a once a year thing. This is not a quarterly thing. This is not a festival thing. This is a daily occurrence when the Spirit of the Lord is moving. There's multiplication. Multiplication. 
but a complaint was brought against those who spoke Aramaic. Wait a minute. This must be a Baptist group or some church group I've been involved with before because there were some complaints. Can you believe there are complaints in the body of Christ? The, the blood-bought body of Christ is complaining. What do we have to complain about? We've been forgiven. We've been filled with the Spirit of God. We have the living, true Word of God in front of us, and here we are complaining. We complain about this, and we complain about that. Yes, even the New Testament church, which was very closely near the time of Christ on the earth himself, and their people are complaining. Complaining. Notice it says that these people were speaking Aramaic. We don't talk about that much, but the Bible was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. And most of the people in the time of Jesus did not speak, speak Hebrew or uh, Latin or whatever. They spoke Aramaic, which was a type of uh, localized language. Just like in uh, China, you have hundreds of dialects, but most people uh, speak uh, just one particular language for the Mandarin. So in America, we speak all kinds of languages, and Alabama has its own language, and uh, so do some other places up north and whatever. So anyway, they're speaking Aramaic. These are Greek-speaking Jews. Continue, Karen. Who felt their widows were being overlooked during the daily distribution of food. Ah, that's the complaint. They're neglecting the widows. We have a few widows in this group, one way or another, Okay. Uh, do you know that James says, true religion, say it, true religion, true religion, okay, is caring for the widows and the orphans. It's not having Bible studies. It's not taking offerings all the time. It's not big, building big choirs and big complexes. True religion is caring for orphans and the widows. And yet, in the New Testament early church, they were neglecting the widows. They weren't giving them the fair share of the food. Remember that we read together with our brother last week as uh, as Steve was teaching us. He did a great job last week, Steve. And, and the people shared their possessions. They sold land. And they shared the profits with the body of Christ. And so here, the widows are being neglected. And I hate to say it, but I've seen a lot of churches where the widows are kind of just forgotten. They're living alone. They are separated from the body of Christ on a regular basis, even before COVID-19. But we must be reminded, true religion is caring for whom? The widows and the orphans. So I challenge you and myself and my wife and family, look for widows people who are without family nearby, and let's meet their needs in any way that we can. And also those who are without their parents. You know, you're an orphan when your parents die. It doesn't just mean that you lost your parents in childhood. Several people in this group, in fact, the majority of people in our group tonight, are orphans in one way. Both of your parents have died. And we need to care for one another. We need to be fatherly and motherly to each other in the time of loss. Continue. The twelve apostles called a meeting of all the believers and told them. Stop. Okay. So you see how we're going to have the class. It's kind of like when I work with uh, Tom sometimes. Uh, notice there were twelve apostles. I've told you this before. The number twelve in the Bible means divine government. What does number twelve mean? Divine government. Divine government. Okay. And... Uh, so we had 12 tribes, we have 12 apostles, we had 12 disciples, and there's going to be 12 uh, in, in heaven, and then the 24 elders. It's, all the numbers of the Bible are not random. God is not a random God. He is organized. He's structured. Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God has a purpose. And even the words speaking through this donkey tonight as maybe uh god uses balaam's donkey god will use me tonight to speak to you every word has accountability when it comes from the servants of god it is not advantageous for us to be pulled away from the word of god to wait on tables okay it's not advantageous nice big word i like to use it okay i teach english uh it's not to an advantage 
for the prophets of God, the teachers of God's word, to be spending their time preparing meals and delivering them. There are different positions in the Bible, in the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones. And the church here realizes they need some assistance, and they're called deacons. Later we learn of a Phoebe, a deaconess, a, a female deacon. And they are primarily designated not to rule over the church. Like many churches, the deacons rule the church. That's not the role in the New Testament. The role of the deacons and the deaconesses is to serve widows, orphans, and the body of Christ. And we have uh, worked in some churches where this is remarkable, where the women and uh, the men are great servants of the Lord. I worked with a number of pastors in my many years in the ministry, over 40 years in the ministry. And I was an associate pastor, minister of music, minister of education, minister of youth. And I worked for a number of pastors who really wanted to cut the grass. Or they wanted to repair the windows. Their gift was helps, and yet they had been called to pastor a church. That is not the work of the ministry of the pastor. It's not the work of the teacher to cut the grass and fix the building. But many churches, especially in rural areas, expect the pastor to do everything. But God says here in the Word, in the New Testament church, that the apostles, the leaders, should be spending their time in the Word of God and preaching the living Word of God and not preparing meals and taking care of the widows specifically. That does not mean they don't do some of it, but many of those menial chores should be done by the rest of the body of Christ so that when we hear the men of God preach or teach, we know they have been with Jesus. They didn't spend their time cutting grass, fixing the roof, but they've been in the Word of God. They've been listening and seeing the miracles of Almighty God, and then they share them to us in our excitement. Continue. We want you to carefully select from among yourselves seven godly men. Seven. Seven is the number for divine completion. Every time you see the number seven in the Bible, it means completeness, perfectness. Even as God is complete, he is perfect. Okay? And so... Make sure... I'm Excuse sorry. Me. Go ahead. So I'm, I'm talking, okay? So therefore, seven godly men. I hate to tell you a secret. I have worked with many deacons who were not godly men. They were drunkards. They were dope addicts. They were molesters. They were abusive to their family. I know that because I had to deal with much of the counseling of these people through the years. Some of you have known such people, but they were put in the office of deacon servant because of their pocketbook. Maybe they would give a good contribution to the budget or because of prestige. Their family has always had deacons. They've always had people in these committee chairs. And so we don't choose people for popularity. It's better to have less than seven or whatever the number might be than to have unqualified, ungodly men can I hear an amen with your thumb up? It's better to have godly men than just somebody who's influential. Continue. Make sure they're honorable, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And we will give them the responsibility of this crucial ministry of serving. So what is their ministry? Serving. Not ruling, not leading like many churches. How many have been in churches where the deacons basically decided most of the things? Some? Okay. Uh, in other situations, we happen to have had at North, uh, North Wake and other places, uh, elders. But it's the deacons and deaconesses that should be serving the needs, the practical needs of the congregation. And notice these should be honorable that should be in their business dealings, in their life, in their speech, in their habits. And they should be full of the Holy Spirit. I've known many deacons. Didn't even know anything about the Holy Spirit. Never heard of the Holy Spirit. Because it just kind of went over their head when it was taught or when it was read to them. This is serious. This is crucial ministry. Crucial comes from the same word, the cross. It's the crux. It's the crucial. It's very vital. 
It's so vital that James said pure religion is caring for widows and orphans, serving people. Continue. That will enable us to give our full attention to prayer and preaching the word of God. Okay. Do we think of most ministers as ministers of prayer and preaching? Or do we see them in their other giftedness? And they should be primarily known for their prayers and for their preaching, for their teaching. Uh, when somebody calls me, uh, as I had a call earlier this evening, uh, I was asked immediately to pray. And the Spirit of God spoke through my prayer to this need. And I expect God to do a wonderful uh, transition in the situation. And this is what men of God should be willing to do. To be instant in season, in prayer, and giving the word, and testifying, and preaching. Everyone in the church loved this idea. What? I can't believe that. Everyone loved it? When have you ever known a church to be in accord like this? Would this sound like a great, great thing? You know, let's have some people take care of the physical needs of the widows and other people. Keep going. So they chose seven men. One of them was Stephen, who was known as a man full of faith and overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Okay, Stephen comes from the same word of Zephaniah in the Old Testament, okay? And it means crowned one, crowned one, someone who has been awarded a crown. I told you the story one time about, I had a dear friend named Garland, and he hated his name all those years growing up. He just hated the name Garland. And he said, I'll never name my child Garland because he was made fun of all the time in school. And so then he was married and they had some children and he had a son named Stephen. And then he met me, the name Smith. You know, I'm a name dropper. And I said, oh, Stephen means crowned one. And uh, And I said, oh, by the way, Garland means crowned one. So he had named his son after himself without even knowing it. Isn't that a miracle? So crowned one. And we need to all consider ourselves as crowned in righteousness, the righteousness of God. And the Bible says, as Christians, we are earning crowns of righteousness, which we will one day lay at the feet of Jesus Almighty, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Are you earning crowns? How do we get crowns? Leading people to the Lord, giving testimony, uh, sharing our faith, our, our relationships of Jesus Christ. These are the way that we receive crowns of righteousness. So Stephen, the crowned one, is full of faith and he's overflowing. He's not just keeping it to himself, you know. A lot of people, they get the Holy Ghost or they get, they get a relationship with God and they just keep it to themselves. No, God says, let it overflow into others. Let other people catch the infection, not of COVID-19, but of the Holy Ghost, full of joy and the fruit of the Spirit. That's the kind of infection we need in this world today. Continue. Along with him, they chose Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch who had converted to Judaism. Okay, these were Greek-speaking people who had turned to Judaism, and now they've come to the faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, there was a big argument in the New Testament church, you have to become a Jew to become a Christian. And they had all these big meetings, the Jerusalem Council, and they finally concluded that the Jews couldn't keep uh, the legalistic way of Judaism, so how could they expect it of the Gentiles who were now receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? So these people became a part of Jesus, not because they were good Jews, but because they were full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Continue. All seven stood before the apostles, who laid their hands on them and prayed for them, commissioning them to this ministry. Okay, here is a ministry that is very ignored in most churches the ministry of laying on of hands and i want to just mention for a second in the old testament we have abraham and isaac and jacob and we see the power of the blessing as they lay hands on their children 
they pray into them the attributes that they desire their children to have before Almighty God. If you have never done that with your children or grandchildren, I commission you, I encourage you, I exhort you, lay hands in a respectful way and pray into your children, your grandchildren, any that you have authority over, your employees sometimes, and bless them with the gifts that God imparts through you into them. I have done this to hundreds and hundreds of people through the years. And uh, when my wife and I were starting to have children, uh, we had many men of God, people like Jerry Falwell. You may or may not like him, but he was a man of God. God used him. He laid his hands on my children and blessed them. And uh, uh, Adrian Rogers, some of you know him, or... Uh, just many men of God, not only preachers, but also musicians. They laid hands and prayed the attributes that God worked through them into the life of my children. And my children have been anointed in use of God. And I believe a lot of it is because of the laying on of hands of God's servants upon those under their care. So we need to pray for people. And there is a transmission when a man of God lays hands upon someone and prays in the Spirit of God, there is a transmission, there is a release of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit into the people they're praying for. However, this is very important, please wake up and listen to me here. There are many people who are laying hands on others who are imparting evil spirits, religious spirits. Be careful who lays hands on your children. Be careful who lays hands on you. Because there's, for everything that God has, the devil has a counterfeit. Say the word counterfeit. counterfeit. It's against reality. And there are many people in the ministry, many people in uh, famous movements that are imparting wrong spirits into gullible people who do not sense that God is not in it. They run after people, and they buy the merchandise, and they have their hands pray, and they have them uh, uh, slay them in the spirit of whatever. Be careful who lays hands on you. Be very careful who lays hands on your children, because this is not a simple, silly matter. This is very serious in the spiritual realm. Continue. God's word. First of all, to... when they laid hands, they prayed, and then they commissioned them. They gave them marching orders. They gave them assignments. What is your assignment in the body of Christ tonight, this week? What is your assignment in this turmoil in our country today? What is your assignment? What is my assignment? We know first it starts with prayer, and then God will speak to us or direct us from his scriptures as to how to heal our land. In Second Chronicles 7.14, it says, If we will humble ourselves and confess our sin and appeal to God, God will hear from heaven and heal our land. But many people are not willing to humble themselves. Many more are unwilling to confess their sins. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so we need to accept the commission God has for us. Continue. God's word reigned supreme. Hallelujah. And kept spreading. What does that mean to you, Karen? God's word reigned supreme. When it was spoken, people were aware of it, and they knew it was something special and powerful. Okay, and did, <clears throat> did they hide it under a bushel? No! They're going to let it shine. Let's just remind ourselves. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. And I'm going to tell you a secret. It's going to offend somebody in the crowd. If you couldn't sing that little song, you have a pride issue. 
Because even the simple things, we must come to God as a little child in faith and believe that if we let our light, our testimony shine, God's going to do something. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Are you going to let it shine? This is not silly. This is actually dramatic. Are we willing to let our light shine? Jesus says, ye are the light of the world. That's you. That's me. We're the light of the world as Christians. And uh, the Bible says that we should let our light shine so that when they see us, they glorify the Father which is in heaven. We are supposed to be like Luna, the moon. We are only a lunar surface. We are a reflection of God's light. And any light people see in mine Existence should be his light reflected from my lunar surface. We are nothing but moons to the great Son of God, the true light that has come into the world. That was the true light, Jesus. Continue. The number of Jesus' followers in Jerusalem quickly grew and increased. There by we the go day. again. If God is working, what should you expect? What should you expect? Increase. Multiplication. There's several churches in our area now that are having three services with 1,200, 1,500 people per service, even in the COVID-19 times. And people are being saved and baptized. We're so thankful that uh, Isaac Goodine uh, accepted Christ publicly last Sunday and was baptized in one of the local churches along with many other people. And this is what shows that Christianity is real. There's fruit. There's re reproduction. There is multiplication. There's increase. Not just once or twice a year, but daily. Weekly at least. Amen? Can I hear an amen with a thumb? Gary, you bless me when you raise your thumb. Amen. Praise God. Continue, Karen. Even a great number of Jewish priests became believers and were obedient to the faith. You've got to be kidding. Come on. Jewish priests? Taught to hate Jesus? To believe that Jesus was the um, opposite of Moses' teaching? that he was everything against the Old Testament. But when they heard the word of God, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And these people, priests, Jewish priests, trained for years, they yielded their heart in humility. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. These priests believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and were saved and added to the church, which basically means... They were baptized too, because in those days, when a person believed, they were baptized immediately. They didn't wait uh, once a year baptism. And uh, you remember when uh, uh, the um, Philip was having the great revival in Samaria, and God supernaturally transported him to the Ethiopian uh, on the side uh, of his chariot, and there they studied the scriptures, and the uh, eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch, received Christ. And he said, there's some water. What's to prevent me from being baptized? Well, nothing. There's water. There's a believer. Let us do what he said. You know, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And God, God promises to always be with us. You know, this business of waiting weeks and months until the yearly harvest and baptism, that's not biblical. It's a daily thing. It's a weekly thing at the minimum. And yet, some churches don't baptize one person in a whole year. What's wrong with those people? It doesn't sound like the New Testament church I'm reading here. Do you think that is? Be aligned with churches and people who follow the pattern in God's Word. They preach Jesus only. He's the only salvation. 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And that's the only way. And once we preach him, we teach him, and we live by example, we need to invite these people to come forth and to repent, be baptized, and be another one of the family of God reaching out to the lost world. Continue. Stephen, who was a man full of grace and supernatural power. What a man. Everywhere you read about Stephen. He's full of grace and faith and power and the Holy Spirit. What did he do? Performing many astonishing signs and wonders and mighty miracles among the people. Wait a minute now. He does not have a seminary degree. Uh, he's not a pastor of a church. He's not an apostle. He's just a server, a servant. He's just an ordinary Christian. And yet, look what he had. Supernatural power. He was full of grace. He was full of the Holy Ghost. He was full of wisdom. And look, he's performing miracles without all the experience that we sometimes require people. I can remember growing up Southern Baptist. I'm still Southern Baptist. I just call myself Baptocostal because I have received the Spirit many years ago. I'm still Southern Baptist in doctrine and in experience. I am full of the Spirit of God and willing to be used of God. But I can remember that uh, I could not believe that people did not go and share the gospel. And we thought only those who could reach certain qualifications education, money, heritage, health. Only those people could be missionaries. And over the years, I've met hundreds, if not thousands of people who have gone to serve the Lord for a week, a month, a year, three years or whatever, and God used them. And many of those qualification requirements have been dropped. And many more people are being sent as missionaries by different churches and groups. Continue. Uh, I'll start with verse 9. Is that okay? Yeah. This upset some men belonging to a sect who call themselves the men set free. They were Libyans, Egyptians, and Turks. Okay. These are men who oppose the will of God, the miracles of God. Have you noticed Christians, supposed Christians, I don't know where they are or not, only God knows the heart. When people reject the power of God, when people reject miracles, oh, that's not for today. That was New Testament. That died when all the apostles died. I don't believe that. God didn't show us the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, to say it's all going, it's all going to die in a hundred years. No. He talks about it lasting, and it has all through the centuries. And in the last days, that's where we are now, approaching these last days, even greater signs and wonders are supposed to be happening. And they are in some places where people are ready to humble themselves and believe God's word. These people were also translated in the King James Version as libertines. Libertines. And uh, these people believed they should drink, sleep around, and do anything they want because now they're saved by the grace of God and they don't have to live a life uh, according to the word of God. And we have churches filled with that. We have relatives that have that belief. That once you become a Christian or once you're baptized as a baby, which is actually sprinkling, uh, that you can do whatever you blankety blank well pleased to do. That is not scriptural. The libertines are actually against the miracles and the power of God. And every time God is working, there's always going to be a group of people to rise up in opposition to what God is doing. Expect it. It's not going to be all roses and flowers and sweet-smelling fragrance and lots of money and comfort. No. Expect persecution. Why would Jesus teach in the Beatitudes, blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness' sake? There's going to be persecution. And uh, we have all experienced some manner of persecution if we have been in the will of God. One other name for this group is the Synagogue of the Freedom Libertines. The synagogue is the learning place of Libertines. We get our word liberty from the same word that these groups are translated from. 
we can blankety blank well what we please because now we're Christians. That is not biblical. These are people who say, oh, we're under the grace of God. We can never be punished. We will not have to suffer any judgment. That is not biblical. We are judged every day by our conduct, our word, our speech, our attitudes, our motives. Number 12, faith number 12. They all confronted Stephen to argue with him. But the Holy Spirit gave Stephen remarkable wisdom to answer them. His words were prompted by the Holy Spirit, and they could not refute what he said. So the men set free conspired in secret to find those who would bring false accusations against Stephen and lie about him by saying, We heard this man speak blasphemy against Moses and God. Notice that when God is working through his servants, that people will lie and do everything they can to destroy credibility and integrity of what God is doing. If it happens to some of the greatest men in the Christian church history or in the world today, why would you not expect it to happen to you? Expect persecution, but know the Lord will not forsake us. He will never leave us. He will be with us. Continue. The men set free agitated the crowd, the elders and the religious scholars, then seized Stephen and forcefully took him before the Supreme Council. Here they grabbed Stephen, this holy man of God, and they took him to be judged by the Supreme Council. Go. One after another, false witnesses stepped forward and accused Stephen, saying, This man never stops denigrating our temple and our Jewish law. For we have heard him teach that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and change the traditions and customs that Moses handed down to us. Okay, and notice what happens next. Keep going. Every member of the Supreme Council focused his eyes, his gaze on Stephen. For right in front of their eyes, while being falsely accused, his face glowed as though he had the face of an angel. So here in the midst of the accusation, in the midst of the lies, in the midst of judgment, persecution, rebellion against God's word, all of these people, every one of them it says, could not help but notice Stephen's face. It was like the face of an angel. An angel is a messenger of God, a servant of God. And we'll see that again in a minute as he's being stoned to death, that people see the face of Stephen is actually the face of an angel or server, a child of the living God. I wonder, what do people see when they see your face and my face every day? You know, weekly I try to tell everybody in this group, put some light on you, you know, put some light on your face. You know, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil and do not come to the light lest they be reproved. So we need to walk in the light as he is in the light. So I encourage you to walk in the light of where your face glows, where people can see not your countenance, not the number of wrinkles in your face, not the empty pores up here where the hair is gone, not the molds and all the problems that we have in our uh, own physical condition, but they see the glory of the Lord on them. Do you remember when the temple was dedicated in the Old Testament, that the glory of the Lord came and filled the temple, and people were slain in the Spirit, they were cast down, in the awe and the presence of Almighty God? Well, the Bible says, Know ye not that you are the temple of the living God. I am the temple of the living God. You are too if you are a believer of Jesus Christ. And our temple should not reflect our own likeness. I've shared this before, but we knew a lady named Catherine Benzel. She was in her 60s or so when I met her. She was an unclaimed blessing in Alabama. That means an old maid and uh, unclaimed blessing. And uh, physically, you would say she was very unattractive. She had very crooked teeth, and she just had kind of a twisted-looking face. But she was one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen in my life. Because when you looked in her face, into her eyes, you could see the countenance of Almighty God. You could see the joy of the Lord. And no matter what, she had faith to believe that we are going to succeed. We're going to have God with us. She was one of my early mentors in my life. 
we named one of our children after her. Uh, she was a mighty woman of God, and yet she was not physically attractive, but everybody who met her thought, this woman is so beautiful. They didn't even know what they were looking at. They were looking at the spirit of God living through this living temple, Catherine Benzel. Hallelujah. May that be said of us in the days ahead. Well, this is an amazing chapter that we've gone through, and uh, we need to ask God to impart by the laying on hands or through words of testimony, words of prophecy, uh, these truths of our life. And then we move over into what happened to Stephen. And we'll move quicker through this. Continue Acts chapter 7. The high priest asked, Are these accusations true? Stephen replied, My fellow Jews and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our ancestor Abraham while he was living in Iraq and before he moved to Haran in Syria. God said to him, Go, leave behind your country and your relatives. Begin your journey and come to the land that I will show you. Okay. So, the, the title or the emphasis tonight is that leadership has a cost. Leadership and discipleship are very costly. It's not free. It's not a dream. It's not a vacation. It's costly. In this case, Abraham and his family, uh, at one time it was 75 people. They moved from one place to another. So quite often, God will move you in your life. And God will give you opportunities to reach different types of people, different levels of society. So the cost of leadership may require you to have a change in work, house location, uh, people group that you work with. And um, I think about our family that we pray for often. I teach the children two times a week. I teach them tonight, you know, uh, uh, the Donner family over in Kazakhstan. You know, they have left the comforts of America to live there, surrounded by unbelievers and every type of legalistic, non-Christian restriction imaginable. But yet they're there on faith. And they've been there for years serving God. And we need to pray for them. Mark and Dinara and their sons, their three boys. And there are so many others. We've had contact with some through our missionaries at different churches, our personal relationships. We need to pray for those far-flung families from different churches. And we must be willing to go. You know, I, I keep hearing of people uh, who went as, on missionary trips in their 60s and 70s. And uh, God can still use any one of us in this group if we're willing to go. It may be to go across the ocean. It may be across the street. It might be across the hall. It may be down the hall in our own house. But we must be willing to go. That's a price a cost of discipleship and leadership. Continue. So Abraham left southeastern Iraq and began his journey. He settled in Haran in Syria and stayed there until his father passed away. Then God had him move to the land of Israel with only a promise. What? Only a promise? No paycheck? No benefits? No retirement plan? Just a promise? And he acted upon it? to change his whole family? Although God gave him no parcel of land he could call his own, not even a footprint, yet he promised Abraham that he and his descendants would one day have it all. And even though as yet Abraham had no child, God spoke with him and gave him this promise. Your descendants will live in a foreign land with a people who will make slaves of them and oppress them for 400 years. But... I will judge the nation that enslaves them, and your descendants will be set free to return to this land to serve and worship me. What is the purpose of God's blessing them? For the people of God to serve God and to worship him. If we're going for any other reason, it's wrong. If we're going to make money, if we're going to build up a name of a church, the name of a denomination, some kind of program or some ministry, we're in the wrong business. Our only main reason for serving God, whether it's across the ocean or across the street, is to serve the Lord and to worship Him in our conduct. Well, we know the story. We will not go all through this, but uh, 
Jacob's uh, sons became jealous of Joseph. We know all about that. Then there was the famine, and then there was the uh, necessary trip of Jacob to send his sons to get food, and they were saved. And then Joseph revealed himself. That's in this, this sermon here. And verse 14, Karen. 14. Joseph sent for his father Jacob and his, his entire family, a total of 75 people, to come and reside in Egypt. Eventually, Jacob died there along with all of his sons and for, our forefathers. Their bones were later carried back to the promised land and buried in Shechem in the tomb Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor. And this was the first capital of Israel. And uh, verse 17, the time drew near for God to fulfill the prophetic promise he had made to Abraham. I'm here to tell you tonight, the time is at hand for God to fulfill many promises throughout the New Testament, through prophets, uh, through men of God, women of God, through the years. The time is near. It is at our hand. We're going to see things happen very rapidly. The good, the bad, and the ugly are going to happen. And we need to be prepared. We need to be willing to make sacrifices. We need to continue to pray for those in authority in our country. We need to uh, support. We need to watch what we say. Let the words of my mouth, say it with me, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. If we don't do that on a daily basis, we're going to get caught up in all of the confusion. And we're not going to be helping God. We're going to be working against God. We're going to be anti-God. Say it one more time. Let the words of my, words mouth, of my mouth and, and the, the meditations, meditations of my heart, my heart be, be acceptable in thy, sight. in thy sight. O Lord, my Lord, strength, strength and, and my, my redeemer. redeemer. And be careful. Every word. Uh, the famous poetess Emily Dick Dickinson said, A word is like a little bird. Once it's released, you may never be able to capture it again. So every word that we speak, we're accountable for. Let us speak the truth, the word of God, the living word. Let us be honest and uh, diligent to guard our mouths. There's many times where I have to say to myself, Shut your mouth. And I'm not talking to my wife. I'm not talking to my children. I'm not talking to this home group. I'm having to tell myself, shut your mouth. Anyone feel like that sometime? We need to watch it, okay? Uh, so we know the story of Moses, and uh, this goes on. It's a beautiful story. I have so much to share. But we're going all the way over to verse 32, Karen. Verse 32. Yahweh, the, the Lord Yahweh spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. And this is what he said. I am the living God, the God of your ancestors. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Trembling in God's presence and overwhelmed with awe, Moses didn't even dare to look into the fire. Okay, notice that in the presence of God, there is awe. It's not like, look at me, I'm with God. <laughs> no. It's humility, it's awe, it's respect. And some people try to te teach or uh, they try to uh, drop names to the point that they're buddy-buddy with Jesus. Jesus is my co-pilot. He better not be. He better be the pilot, not the co-pilot. But people have bumper stickers. Jesus is my co-pilot. No, he better be the pilot. And we don't need to be bragging over our relationship with God. We need to be thankful, submitted, surrendered to his lordship. He is the pilot. And uh, his name in the original Hebrew is Yahweh. Now many of you have grown up with the word Jehovah. Jehovah is a made-up word about 500 years ago where you took the name Yeshua, and you took uh, the name um, for the plurality of God, and you put those two together, 
and you make up the word Jehovah. But that was not a word until the last 500 years or so. But the word Yahweh is more correct to call him. Remember that in the Hebrew language there are no vowels. So that would be uh, Y-H-V-H or Y-H-W-H, okay? And, uh, but most people have transliterated it to Yahweh, or we say Yeshua. So Jesus, Yeshua, Yahweh are all the same basic name that means salvation. Didn't he say there's salvation in no other name under heaven and earth? Yahweh. So when the Bible was written, uh, it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. The Psalms were written mostly in Hebrew. And if you'll read Psalm 23, which is a favorite of most people on this broadcast, on this podcast or whatever, uh, they'll say, the Lord is my shepherd. That is wrongly translated. Lord comes the word Adonai. And so, since the Jewish people did not want to irreverently say the name of Yahweh, they would say the Lord. They would say Adonai. And so it's translated into English, Ad Adonai, which means the Lord. But it should say, Yahweh is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not want of anything. And so therefore, Yahweh is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Trembling in God's presence and overwhelmed with awe. If we come into the presence of God, there needs to be respect. There needs to be awe. There needs to be awe. There needs to be wonder. And uh, not just, oh, hi, Jesus is in the house. That's, that's kind of being disrespectful. Jesus is in the house. Well, that is a modern expression. But if you are in the presence of the mighty God, the creator of the universe, there should be more awe. There should be more respect. That's my personal opinion. Verse 33, Karen. Out of the flames, the this Lord Yahweh... This is Acts Yahweh... 7, 33. What? Acts 7, 33. I'm telling that to our dear Wanda who joined us. Oh. You want me to read? Yeah. Out of the flames, the Lord Yahweh said to him, <clears throat> Take the sandals off your feet. For you are standing in the realm of holiness. I have watched and seen how my people have been mistreated in Egypt. I have heard their painful groaning. And now I have come down to set them free. So come to me, Moses, for I am sending you to Egypt to represent me. Okay, so notice that <clears throat> in the presence of God, <clears throat> it's not a hoedown. It's not put on your boots and let's just honk, honk, hop around and make a lot of noise. It's actually taking your shoes off, which is an act of submission. It's an act of uh, uh, respect. And if you'll do a study in the Bible, which I'm going to do after this class, about sandals and feet and respect, you'll notice it's amazing. You know that Jesus said about John the Baptist that he was a man that uh, uh, most people were not even worthy to, to take his shoe off, that John the Baptist was such a great man of God, full of faith and obedient. And uh, we know that uh, when uh, Mary Magdalene washed Jesus' feet, she took off his sandals and she washed Jesus' feet with her own tears in respect, adoration. So we need to approach God with more respect, I believe, than most today. So we know in verse 35 and following, God sent back to Egypt. The people were set free. They journeyed for a while. Then they began to see miracles. The Red Sea, the, um, the drowning of the Pharaoh's army. And then we come to verse 38, Karen. 38. Moses led the congregation to the wilderness, and he spoke face to face with the angel who spoke with him on the top of Mount Sinai. Along with our ancestors, he received the living oracles of God that were passed down to us. But our forefathers refused to obey. They pushed him away, and their hearts longed to return to Egypt. That's what's happening in our country today. <clears throat> Both sides of the aisle, whatever aisle that might be, people have refused to obey the word of God. 
and uh, they are following a man or a movement and not the living God. We must be very careful who we adore. We must be very careful what we say about ourselves, our friends, our group, but also we must be careful what we say about our enemies. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for them. Not curse them out, not challenge them, not fight them, not try to do that. And I've said this once before in this group. Uh, we're supposed to love our enemies, but hate God's enemies. It's just the opposite. We love more of God's enemies, the things of this world, Satan, and the pleasures of this life, uh, than we do our own enemies. Uh, we're to hate God's enemies, but love our enemies. I know that's hard for many people to understand. and uh, But I was told a long time ago, there's th two things you can do with your enemies. Make them your friend and love them, or kill them. Sounds drastic. Tragically, many people are trying to kill their enemies because Jesus said, even if you think it in your heart, even if you speak it with your mouth, you have committed murder. And we have to be so careful what we say against our enemies. We don't judge people by their label or their political party or the denominational label. We need to love our enemies and pray that they would see in us that reflection of the light of God, even Jesus himself. Continue. While Moses was on the mountain, our forefathers said to Aaron, Make us gods to lead us, because we don't know what has become of this Moses who brought us out of Egypt. So they made a god, an idol in the form of a bull calf. They offered sacrifices to it and celebrated with the light what their own hands had made. And that's our society today. People are celebrating the idols that they have made, not the principles of God. So much here. I wish we had more time and more interest we would continue more, but anyway, moving on to verse 51, we're at the close. I hope you'll stay in for just about four or five more minutes. Go ahead. Why would you be so stubborn as to close your hearts and ears to me? You're always opposing the Holy Spirit, just like your forefathers. Which prophet was not persecuted and murdered by your ancestors? Whoa, you mean God allows prophets to be misunderstood? to be hated, to be persecuted, to be destroyed? Does God still have prophets in the world today? A prophet is one who speaks for God. God has the gift of prophecy, one who speaks forth and one who speaks forward. Two types of prophets in the New Testament. And prophets are usually hated by the majority of people because they don't want to face the truth. Prophets go around with a big mirror and say, take a look at yourself. And the mirror is the word of God. That is the mirror that we have to look at. Continue. Name just one. They killed them all, even the ones who prophesied long ago of the coming of the righteous one. Now you follow in their steps and have become his betrayers and murderers. You have been given the law by the visitation of angels, but you've not obeyed it. Ah, what a message to the United States. Go ahead. When they heard these things, they were overtaken with violent rage, filling their souls, and they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, overtaken with great faith, was full of the Holy Spirit. He fixed his gaze into the heavenly realm and saw the glory and splendor of God and Jesus, who stood up at the right hand of God. Notice what the suffering slain martyr the first recorded martyr of the church. Is he cursing his accusers? Is he bringing down hell, fire, damnation on those who are killing him? He actually will tell the Lord to forgive these people. They don't know what they're doing. Same thing Jesus said on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Look, Stephen said, I can see the heavens opening and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God to welcome me home. So, Stephen's focus was not on the present. It was on the future that he was entering into. 
that he was going to be with God Almighty, that Jesus was standing in heaven waiting to welcome him. We should not fear death. If we know the Lord, if we've been saved, if we're in the will of God particularly, we should rejoice whether we live another day or another ten years or whatever. We should be ready and look forward to seeing Jesus. We don't have to usher it in by bad behavior or some kind of personal harm to ourselves. But whatever God has, the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord, and he, God, delights in them. So God has planned your life. He's planned my life. He has ordered our steps. And we need to realize that God delights in us. He loves us. He's got a plan. And notice that he can see Jesus in heaven. That's a tremendous vision. You know, no telescope. He saw through faith God. And that's how you need to see and I need to see tonight. Let's finish this up. His accusers covered their ears with their hands and screamed at the top of their lungs to drown out his voice. Then they pounced on him and threw him outside the city walls to stone him. His accusers, one by one, placed their outer garments at the feet of a young man named Saul of Tarsus. We had a teaching a year or so ago about clothing in the Bible. Clothing represents authority. And when they put their garments on the ground at the feet of Saul of Tarsus, who later was changed to Paul, Paul, the great missionary, first major missionary, uh, they took off their garments, which identified their clans, their their tribes and whatever. And they put their authority there while they acted under the authority of the devil to kill this first martyr, Stephen, the crowned one. Continue. As they hurled stone after stone at him, Stephen prayed, O Lord Jesus, accept my spirit into your presence. He crumpled to his knees and shouted in a loud voice, O Lord, don't hold this sin against him. And then he died. This should be our prayer tonight for those around us who are doing acts that are against God's will. O Lord, don't hold this sin against them. Be merciful. Bring them to the light. The light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. That was the true light, Jesus, that came into the world to reveal the truth. And for those who are acting in the realm of darkness in our world today, particularly in the United States, we don't need to, to hate these people. We need to be merciful and pray that God would bring in a great revival. And many of us believe that God is going to usher in a great revival as people see the torment, as they see the suffering, as they see uh, the hatred of one person or one group towards another. We need to cry out for the mercy of living the living God and pray for their salvation. Daniel said it when he said, He that winneth souls is wise. If we ever needed wisdom, we need it in this nation today. And how do you get wisdom? You win the lost to Jesus. He that winneth souls is wise. Don't get caught up in all of the peripheral things. Keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing is to love the Lord our God with all our mind, our heart, our soul, our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. May the peace of Jesus be with you as you and I live this out together. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Broken. Broken, I want to ask you on um, uh, the significance of this. Looking at verse, uh, chapter 7, verse um, 55, mm -hmm. it said, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw uh, the glory of God in Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Mm -hmm. Often we hear about Jesus being seated at the right hand of the Father. What's, what's the difference and what's the significance? Well, normally the, the custom of which this is understood is that you stand to welcome someone. You stand to receive someone. Um, and so therefore, this was a time of rejoicing. The Bible says in other places that thousands of angels were rejoicing at his salvation, but I believe also at his homecoming. 
And so uh, during the performance of, the Mas of Messiah by Handel, uh, marvelous, but it's three or four hours long, and uh, during the song, the Hallelujah Chorus, it is reported that the king stood. And when the king stood, everyone stood at attention. And so therefore, we need to realize that when Jesus stood up to welcome Stephen, all of heaven, all of the saints of the Old Testament, those in our modern time, those who have come to be with the Lord, uh, Stephanie standing right there today when, uh, when uh, one of the souls of the lost like Isaac accepting Christ as his Savior, uh, when uh, others that we have, have uh, lost ones this year, that the Lord is standing to welcome those, and all of those who've gone before are there. And the Lord also promises in the Scripture that they are coming back with Jesus. This is in the, uh, in the book of Jude, only one page, that the Lord is coming with the saints, that's the believers, uh, to welcome the church into his presence. For to die in the Lord is to be present with the Lord. Hallelujah.